So you and the team recently won the KDD 2024 competition called Multitask Online Shopping Challenge for LLMs. We did one thing where we said things like, if you get this question correct, we will give you a thousand dollar reward. And that actually boosts, that boosts the score. I kid you not. Or we say things like, if you get this correct, you will solve world peace. And so you could do silly things like that. You had ChatGPT, which we don't know. Maybe it's hundreds of billions of parameters. And you might say, man, it's so smart. Can I teach it anything new? So one of the things I learned in this comp is that fine tuning truly makes a difference. So you have a PhD. You work for the top machine learning company in the world. What advice do you have for people who are currently in their PhD and they, let's say, want to follow the data science track? From personal experience, I will say that all of knowledge, I feel, ultimately makes one a better data scientist because participating on Kaggle has given me an opportunity to do so many different types of models. It's the excitement of having more tools and, you, and anybody who does any kind of work on anything, the more tools just give you so much excitement because it, it boosts your creativity. Something that every data scientist runs into is, do they climb the corporate management ladder or do they pursue the hardcore technical IC path? Not every company has that ability to give folks just your technical work and not manage different people. What's your advice to people when they're at that pivot point? I guess my advice would be that my general advice to people in life, which is... Today, my guest on episode 15 of the AI Portfolio Podcast is the well-known Kaggle Grandmaster, Chris Diot. He's currently ranked number one on notebooks and discussions on Kaggle and is part of the KG Mon team, Kaggle Grandmasters of NVIDIA. We'll be discussing Gen AI and personalization, optimizing your, your Kaggle game, and other strategies to make progress in your career. Chris, very excited to have you on the show. I'm excited to be here, Mark. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Yes, yes. So what excites you the most about this current Gen AI movement? Um, I think I'm just fascinated to, to start. I'm fascinated to see how smart uh, all, all of these LLMs become and if, if they really start mimicking human intelligence. Because I've actually been fascinated, ever since I was super young, I was kind of fascinated in the idea of, you know, one day conversing with a, with a synthetic in, intelligent creation. And what's been interesting is over the past five years that I've competed on Kaggle, when I do things like computer vision or natural language processing, I, I always recognize that the models are always smarter than I am. So I'll train a model to detect certain things in an image and I can't even find it with my own eyes. So I, I, I'm all... So for the last multiple years, I've been thinking, wow, these models are already smarter than me, but you're not, but it's, but you're not, but I'm not, I wasn't talking with them yet. So you don't really know what they're thinking, but now it's exciting, right? Now they're actually talking. We got things like ChatGPT. So now you can sort of probe them and really ask interesting questions to see in what ways is it, is it actually using true understanding or memorization or what have you? So it's, it's a really exciting time and I'm, I'm really anxious to just see how, how far it goes. So it sounds like you're, you're not necessarily in the camp that they're completely memorizing. You do think there's some notion of understanding under the hood? I, I certainly do. Because um, hmm. actually, I actually think that understanding, I've always had a theory that understanding is somewhat of a form of memorization, but not, the, not just straight up rote memorization, like here's a fact, I give you the fact just back. But I always think that whenever a human answers a question, I think that we essentially synthesize, uh, I think every answer we say is a combination of multiple things we've learned, right? So in, in essence, I think all through life we're hearing things, and then I think we, we see patterns with all the different things we hear, and then inside of us, we sort of boil it down to maybe core truths or formulas or, or, or patterns or observations. So, and then we kind of have, and that's our personalization. That's how we personalize what we learn. and then. And then so we, we, you can call it memorization because we put these thing, these th ideas inside of us. And I think that's when true intelligence happens. And then later, when someone asks a question, we kind of use the patterns that we created. So we're sort of using. A, so I've always felt it's a form of of memory, right? It, it's a form of how we organize our memories. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, memorization is such a when people hear memorization, they think, oh, no intelligence. So I'm not so but there's something in I guess what I'm saying there's something in between memorization and logical reasoning in just how we how we essentially store the patterns that we see throughout our lifetimes and how we use those patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I've been wondering about LLMs. So humans, I think, think in concepts. And it, it, I think it's concepts we're exposed to over time. So for instance, the concept of a human, the concept of a cat, um, how much more learning do you expect these models to have? I know they won't have the full 
multimodality, uh, especially touch, texture, scent, but they'll have, they're incorporating this vision component now and we're seeing a lot more multimodal models. What's your gut prediction on how much more, uh, excuse me, what the evolution of conceptualization will be in these models? So I think adding the multimodalities will, will really make them much smarter because that, that's, Right, because humans, yeah, we don't we don't just learn by vision or by text. We obviously learn by all five senses. And I think, you know, one of the current problems with LLMs is this hallucination thing. So LLMs just see a lot of things. They don't they never know what's true, what's not true. And they just kind of in some sense, they just uh, repeat back combinations of what they've seen. But but they have no essence of, of sort of true or untrue. I think once we start building kind of physical robots that have a body and sort of operate inside of our world, well, then uh, their eyeballs will be constantly collecting images from the real world and in sounds and they could talk with people. And that and I think that will give them a basis for rea- for what's true and false, because that's how hum- I think that's how humans do it. We know things that we are. Yeah, we know that things that we, we actually observe directly. Uh, through our senses in the real world, we call those facts. And then when we read books and we hear things people say, I think somewhat we compare them, right? It, internally, we kind of compare them to what we what our experiences were in the physical world. And I think that's how we essentially can, can stay afloat of what's true and what's false. But currently, LMs have no ability to ever know what's true and what's false. So that being said, I think the multi, multimodality and, and if they have actually a physical presence in the real world collecting data, I think their intelligence and their ability to, to, to detect truth from fiction will, be, will improve so much. There's one thing, but two things you said there, both the, the sound and the other thing that occurred to me was tonality. So, you know, you're a Kaga grandmaster. So I imagine feature weighting becomes very important in different types of training of models. And I think tonality is very interesting when someone is teaching you and uh, you give them a response and based on their, uh, their response, your teacher's response and the tone of that response, especially as you're growing as a child, when your parents give you a certain tone, you know, hey, this is a, a bad activity that I'm doing. Um, so I, I do think that's a really interesting aspect. What's your thoughts on that for when you start training these models, you know, modulating, excuse me, measuring tonality as you start to accumulate these data sets? Any thoughts there? Yeah, I think it'll be much more information for the models because, correct, they just read text. And even when you just, and this happens when you text your friends, you text them something. We add emojis to try to, uh, try to almost give tone or emotion, but just pure words by themselves uh, don't carry as much information as my face expression does, my tone, uh, my body language. And that's the thing. One, once a robot is, is sort of has has the multimodality and it can listen it can hear the audio it can see the visual of a, of a face it's getting information from and and the words all this is just tons of more information and what we're noticing today is the more information you train the models on the smarter they're becoming right they're just they're just finding more and more text but that's sort of the point i'm making if you add additional information via via sound tone of, of the voice of image an image to go with with the person talking and all this additional data more data in my opinion means smarter and i think we'll really start seeing big differences i haven't spent much time on the multimodal architecture side so i don't know if you have but what intuition can you share so for instance in the llm space when let's say i'm doing inference on a set of tokens and you look at the attention mechanism Right, that's just a combination of some token embeddings, essentially, right? And whatever repetitions they are across each of your attention heads. So each of them would have projected um, your corresponding tokens into a different space. So there's a bunch of different projections that are happening, right? And this is all, quote unquote, in the language space. What's the intuition now when we come into a multimodal space? Because oftentimes, I think the multimodal data sets have a text label that correspond to what's in the image? Any thoughts there on how these models into it multimodal data? That's a that's a great question. I, I actually am not totally familiar with, with with the inner details, but I'll I'll try to provide a few comments. Ultimately, whenever anything is input into the model, whether it's text, images, or whatever, it gets boiled down into an embedding. 
Uh, and that's the representation. And it's just a, a, a mathematical vector. Now, the question, which I'm not quite sure of, uh, is sort of, so, so yeah, so you'll simultaneously see image and text and other multimodalities all happening at once. So you'll have multiple embeddings. I'm not actually sure how the model combines them all. So in your example, mm. going back to the pure text, you've kind of got embeddings for all the individual tokens. We can imagine that's different words. And then you use attention to know when we're focusing on this word, you know, we use, we use portions of these other words, which, which the model determines are related. So t attention is a way of, of filtering out so much information and then, um, and just combining relevant things. So I suspect uh, multimodality can add attention. That's what I'm unsure of. If it's just, mm. if it just has the separate embeddings and they're being added or they're being concatenated. But a more advanced model would essentially have multimodality attention, which is while somebody is talking, you could potentially break the time when my face expressions up into sort of little face tokens, so to speak. And then you could have a multimodality attention, which has my word, and then it attends to different things it sees in my face. Okay, let's attend to how his eyes move because the eye motion is very relevant to this word. Then I say a different word, and maybe the eyes are not so important. This time it's the corners of my mouth. So, you know, the attention could actually combine all the all little pieces from, from different modality. And, and I assume that's what they're going to do, because if you don't do something like that, it's kind of information overload. That's why we use attention. There's just too much things happening at once. You can't attend to everything. A human mm -hmm. can't, a model can't. So, I would guess they're using attention, but as I said, I, I haven't done enough work to really see how all the modalities are, are mixed internally. Cool. Appreciate that perspective. So, you know, there's lots of debate on large language models versus small language models. What's your, your current take and, and way of thinking and reasoning through on these different types of models? I, I think in general, we're obser observing, observing bigger is better and a, a bigger model with more parameters, trained on more data. And I, and I somewhat agree with that. However, uh, more and more we're seeing there's a lot of techniques you can use to make the small models smarter. And, and, and in that sense, I think that we can have small models performing just like big models. And it, it, it's good if we do that because they're so much more efficient to train and infer. And to give you one example of a really popular technique these days is the RAG. It's the retrieval, uh, retrieval augmented generation. But the idea there is, you don't need to actually store all of the knowledge inside uh, the LLM's brain, but rather uh, after the question is asked, you can have uh, databases of the information. Maybe Wikipedia is connected behind the scenes. So the model, so basically the model can, so an algorithm can quickly do a search, find rel, find chunks of text inside of Wikipedia that's related to the question. And then they could show those uh, to the model uh, before it makes an answer. And you can see that essentially gives the model, I mean, if you have a huge database in the back end, you can give the model access to entire physics textbooks, uh, entire Wikipedia, entire this. So it could be a very small model, but it, retrie but it uses retrieval. So tricks like that, I think, can allow us to have small models have access to tons of information and really uh, perform big tasks. All right. So we just talked about large language models, small language models. RAG is eating up the world currently. And I wanted to really understand your, your mindset about LLMs and personalization. I, I think that's one of the most interesting areas that I'm not seeing a lot on yet. So you and the team, a couple of folks from NVIDIA recently won the KDD 2024 competition called Multitask Online Shopping Challenge for LLMs. There were five different tasks. Solution will be in the show notes. Um, the five tasks were understanding shopping concepts, shopping knowledge reasoning, user behavior alignment, multilingual abilities. The last one was a combination. Um, your test data set was 20,000 questions across 57 tasks. And your training set was 96 questions. What were your initial impressions of that competition? Uh, so you said initial. So let me let me first uh, say one of my my post impressions. My post impressions okay. are we had a wonderful time. Uh, it was tons of fun. The all, the team worked together great. We learned lots of stuff. 
Uh, and I guess going into it, that, that was my initial thing. But, but when you first see the challenge, it, it seemed a bit overwhelming, actually, because they don't give you this is the new, the new, the new trend these days. Is they don't give you any training data. So they tell you, OK, make a model that could answer 20,000 questions. And furthermore, we're not really going to tell you what those questions are. So, yeah, we'll give you 96 examples, which cover a few of the tasks. But there's a lot of tasks that you don't know what they are. We're not going to tell you what they are. So, right. So you go into a competition like that and it's intimidating. You don't you think, oh, my goodness, maybe we won't even you know. It's hard to be confident going into a comp like that because there's so much unknown. Uh, but 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 we, we do know the end of the story. Everything worked out. We did great. But it, it was intimidating at first. I'd heard you in other podcasts, you're a big proponent of creating your sort of self-hosted validation set, and then you typically go test that online to see how well you're doing um, when you go on the leaderboard. Did you have that kind of ability here as well? Not exactly, uh, because so when they don't give you training data, that means they don't give you validation data. And if, so it's sort of a catch-22. So let's say we were able to go out there and make a fantastic validation set. So let's say we went out there and we found, I don't know, we found a data set that had tens or hundreds of thousands of questions. And let's say we observed that the performance on the validation data set uh, is just as good as the test data set. Um, I mean, at that point, well, there's a few ways to say this, but basically we didn't have local validation. Um, and and uh, so, ba- so what we ended up doing was, and anytime we try to create one, we never saw a very good correlation with it in the leaderboard. And the leaderboard itself had 20,000 questions, which actually is a pretty large set. So in the end, we end up relying on if it does well on these 20,000 questions and it's solving the te- task versus if we had just created, I don't know, a couple thousand locally, uh, that's actually less reliable. So it's one of these situations where the leaderboard with 20,000 questions ended up giving us more reliable feedback. It's a weird way to operate because you shouldn't really re- you shouldn't rely on the leaderboard scores and the test data. But under the circumstances, we had no better way to validate. Mm, that's very interesting insight. And how long did it take you and the team to get to your final solution? Because there's, I, I'm sure there's so many ups and downs and, you know, you're doing your own gradient descent to find the solution. How long? So we worked constantly for three months. Um, so it took a long time. But uh, we did different tasks th- throughout the competition. So the first half of the competition was a phase one. We did a little bit more exp- exploration. We tried a bunch of models as zero shot. Basically, just download a model as is, give it some, give it some uh, prompt engineering, and see how well it can do. And we tried out a dozen different models to kind of see what, what, what's, what's going on. And then we also played with a bunch of other ideas. So we were very limited. So in this competition, we were limited in inference resources. So we had, to inf- we had to answer all these questions using only uh, four T4 GPUs with 16 gigabytes each at inference time. And to answer, we had to answer about 10,000 questions in under two hours. So th- we have to do it very fast. So also in the first few months, we explored some different frameworks, different ways to quantize the model, different way to accelerate the model, speed it up. So you can see, I would say the first month or two was a lot of just exploring different things. and then. Uh, it was really the last month that we really were just kind of working around the clock. We're going with the, some of the best ideas that we found. We started fine tuning our own model, which would take, you know, it would take it would run overnight and stuff. And then really pedal pedal to the metal for the last last month, and and uh, and all went well. Did you think you were going to win early on? Did you have a good sense that you were going to win, or it was it really came down to the end, and you were actually surprised? So personally, I didn't feel confident that we would we would win maybe into the last couple of weeks mm. because early on, um, yeah, well, we were just trying a whole bunch of different ideas, and our ideas were putting us up in the top five. So we knew I, I always felt we were going to do really well. But there's a big in, in competitions. If you do competitions, you know there is a huge difference between somewhere in the top five and hitting first place, right? It, it's one of these things with, called diminishing returns, because if you put in, you know, you put in X amount of energy and then 
it's it's actually yeah you you put in just a, a set amount a set amount of work and you could jump in the top five. But then to start climbing within the top five, you're doubling, quadrupling, eight times the amount of work just to climb a spot or two, right? I mean, it's so neck and neck. At that point, you're working so hard to get a little gain. So, so early on, I, I was a little unsure uh, if we could hit first. And there's five tracks, right? So I thought we could maybe hit first and uh, here or there, but can we hit first at all five tracks? I mean, it's it's a it's a moment. It's it's a monstrous achievement. So. But in the last couple of weeks, when we were really zooming in on our, our final techniques, we were seeing how great they were working. We were seeing that our score was improving faster than the other competitors. So we actually started gaining some confidence. And we, and we pulled into first place on all the tracks kind of in the last few weeks. But we were, we were kind of confident that people weren't going to pass us because, as I said, basically how fast we were kind of improving our score and stuff. What portion of the competition were you responsible for? Because this is, it's, it's very interesting. I don't personally hear many Kaggle teams share about, okay, this person did, did this, that person focused on inference, this person focused on data set creation, feature creation. What, what was your, um, I guess, how did you feel that you mainly contributed to the effort? Yeah, good question. So I probably did a few things, but it was definitely a big enough project that there was a, there was a role for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, th I spent a lot of time actually in, in some of the data set creation. So you know, we said earlier that there's no training data. So we ended up making 500,000 questions, right? We made that many questions, a data set that large to train our model. So multiple team members were involved in the process. We weren't creating by hand. I mean, I wasn't writing them down. We were essentially using public data sets and then writing uh, different algorithms to kind of to modify the data set and put it into a question answer format or, or the or the different uh, types of questions we saw. So we, so I spent a lot of time doing that, as did other team members. But that was that was a big help. Uh, another team member, uh, Ivan, focused a lot on the fine tuning. He set up a lot of the frameworks and all the code to get the model fine tuning. Once he set up the code, a couple of others, including myself, would then we actually helped out and, and then you know did some of our own fine tuning. So then I did I did get involved in some fine tuning. Uh, we were able to do a little bit of ensembling. So everybody, so different people kind of on on, on uh, fine tune some different LoRa adapters, and then we had, we found a creative way to kind of combine them. So a few of my adapters, what I trained on 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 special little subset of the data, it, it turned out when we sort of ensemble that in, that boosted the score a little. So I did that. I did. I, I was very active also in the initial phases. I did a lot of the exploration. I, I was. Uh, I, I would, you know, you go on. You go on hugging face, and there's tons and tons of models always coming out every few weeks. So I was never satisfied that we had the best one. So every time a new model came out, I would take the work of downloading it, and then it actually takes many hours to prepare a submission because you have to quantize the model. They have to upload tens of gigabytes up to their server. You have to write it all. So I would spend a lot of time just zero shot testing out different models, um, seeing how that works. I would say those are those are probably my, my main contributions. So you created this, you and the team created this 500,000 instruction following kind of data set to fine tune, right? And I think a, a big thing that I haven't heard a lot of people talk about is the actual prompt format and how uh, when you set up these training data sets, each different model would have had their own way of instruction following, probably very specific, or it might be very generic, right? Maybe across Llama versions, they're very similar, but Llama versus uh, you guys chose the Quen2 model. Did you see an impact in that specificity in the prompt on the actual accuracy of your results when you did your fine tuning? When we fine tune the model, it, it, it wasn't so important the prompt we chose because the process of fine tuning it teaches it about the new prompt, right? But we, but before we did our fine tuning, we actually, we did a lot of exploration with zero shot. So as I said, we, we tried different models, but then also um, for each model, we tried to see how good we can get it. And then, and when you, and when you, when you don't fine tune, when you do zero shot a model as is, then changing the prompt has a huge effect. Uh, so we, we did, we did these, we did things. So the prompt is, 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 is broken up into sort of three prompts. There's the system prompt, 
So these are the instructions you give the model. There's like there's called the system prompt, the user prompt, the assistant prompt. But the user prompt is kind of where you give it instructions. You know, I, I, you're gonna see a multiple choice question. I want you to answer with a single number. You know, just just give me say zero. So the the questions were numbered zero, one, two, and three. So just so it it does text generation. It's about it's about the talk, right? So just say a number. Don't tell me a whole bunch of commentary, what you were thinking. So models want to be very verbose. So in the instruction prompt, you say, okay, you're going to answer. You're going to say the number for this question and nothing else, right? So that's the instruction prompt. And then the, the actual user prompt is the question. So here's the question. Uh, here's a product. Uh, which, which, which of these other products do you think is, is a good complement to the first product? So that, that's the actual question. and. We, were, we tried all sorts of things with the system prompt and we saw a big difference. So we did one thing where we said things like, uh, if you get this question correct, we will give you a thousand dollar reward. And that actually what? boosts, that boosts the score. I kid you not. Or we say things like, if you get this correct, you will solve world peace. And so you could do silly things like that. We do other things like um, chain of thought where we say, okay, I'm gonna give you a multiple choice question. For your first step, I want you to identify which choice is not correct and then remove that choice, then consider the next three choices and find the best one amongst that. That gave a big boost. So when you give it instructions, you know, you can tell it to work through steps. You can give it incentives, say you'll give it a reward and you can do all sorts of other, other stuff. And all these things made a big difference uh, if you're doing zero shot. But once we started fine tuning, uh, these things didn't really matter anymore because the process of showing it 50,000 questions with the answer that you want it to say, it, it quickly just, it gets in the, you know, it, it learns the behavior of what it should do. And then at that point, uh, elaborate prompts or sort we, we saw, we observed that elaborate prompts were, were no longer necessary. Hmm. That's so fascinating. And did you see uh, some models respond to the bribery more than others. <laughs> I think so. We um we didn't do, we didn't do a full analysis of that. Um, actually, I think we may have only done it on two models. So the bri so yeah yeah because what yeah because once so I told you we had a dozen models, but once we started seeing which models were doing better, we we were just kind of working with those. So we weren't so when we were trying out all these different prompts, we weren't always it, it, it was too time consuming to constantly try on say the dozen models we had. So towards the end, we'd only do it on maybe, I mean, we started narrowing it down to the Quan 72B, that was very strong, zero shot. Also the Llama, the Llama 3 uh, 70B, that was very strong. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, the, a lot, a lot of the, the final zero shot experiments were just kind of on those two models. We, we, once we saw the other models weren't keeping up, we didn't keep, keep, keep working with all the other ones. Makes sense. Why, why, what's your intuition as to why Quen 2 maybe outperform the Llama. Well, you, that's the one that I guess you guys chose. What, what's your gut sense there? Yeah, so Quan 2 did, did, so again, we're talking zero shot, but, but out of the box, mm. zero shot, Quan 2 did significantly better than the Llama. I can only make guesses. I, I, think, I think the Quan 2 that's, uh, I hope I'm not saying this wrong, I think it's um, f trained by the Alibaba company. And I think ah. they also have a whole e-commerce website. So, per, so mm -hmm. perhaps, perhaps the Quan is actually trained. Maybe they actually train it on a lot of e-commerce data. Maybe they, maybe they actually train it on all their product database and stuff like that. Um, but somehow, I, I would guess there are differences, I guess, in the model architecture. But, but my my gut is uh, the difference is probably just about what was what it was fine tuned on, right? So when you when you take a model off the internet and you do zero shot, it was it was fine tuned on a trillion tokens. That, I mean, that, this is hundreds of billions of text. And there's some standard corpuses. Everybody trains on Wikipedia. Everybody trains on these different corpuses of books and blah, blah, blah. But I think everybody has their secret sauce. So some people might train on more code because they want to think more logically. Some people might train on math problems or might train it on, on, a, on a lot of, uh, just so you can see, there's sort of difference in the choice of, of all the, of the pre-training data. And, and my gut is that maybe it's seen, so it actually did very good. One of the tracks was multilingual translation and stuff. It did very good on that. So, so it's probably fine tuned on, on, on multiple languages. 
And it's probably fine tuned on on a lot of data that's related to e-commerce, possibly stuff off the Ali, Ali, the Alibaba um, information or others. Did you have to do anything to the tokenizer or the, or the same tokenizer for on two worked, you know, even when you did your data set, your 500,000 data set? Um, yeah, so no, we didn't have to, we didn't have to speak the tokenizer. So basically when you download the model, uh, from hugging face, you know, it'll download with its associated tokenizer. So we just use that. And then and likewise, Llama has a different tokenizer, but anyway, uh, basically this tokenizer can already, I mean, it's got, I, I forget a hundred thousand, it's got so many tokens that pretty much whatever text we throw at it, it has no problem. Uh, it has no problem tokenizing it. So, so nothing special we had to do there. Makes sense. So let, let's talk about the technique wise FT, right? Uh, my understanding was you had a zero shot model, so not fine tuned and you had a fine tuned model. And this wise FT was a way of sort of combining the weights given some quote unquote mixing factor. Um, can you describe it a bit better than I did? <laughs> yeah, well, you did a good job. So this was a, this was a, um, a discovery that Simon made. So he was one of the guys on, on, the, on the team and, the, and he focused you were asking the different the different roles. As you see, everybody kind of had a specialized role. So he actually spent a lot of his time on this. But that was a discovery he made that, you know, it, it was sort of not the typical way of doing things. So when you fine tune uh, one of these huge, and when I say huge, it's 72 billion parameter LM, what you end up doing is you use a technique called LoRa, which is a low rank adaptation. Uh, so you train, you train this thing, this, so you, you don't actually modify all the 72 billion, uh, per billion weights. You actually just modify a smaller number of weights in this LoRa adapter. And then when you're done, you just, um, you essentially just fuse the two together. And that's the standard. And, and people just do that. And then, and then once you fuse it, it, it has all the new knowledge that you trained it with. But the idea that Simon had was, well, when you fuse it, it becomes this new trained model. But Simon recognized that even the zero shot without the adapter did very well. So essentially what he said is, well, we could think about if we want to, if we want to create an ensemble of the zero shot model and our fine tuned model, then what we do is instead of fusing the adapter, we can, uh, we can, the adapter is just a whole bunch of numbers. And, 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 and the way the adapter just, it just, they're all different. It just adds on. When you fuse an adapter, you just add the, the adapter has numbers. You just add all those numbers to all the existing numbers. So what Simon said was, instead of adding all those numbers, let's multiply all the numbers by say 50%. And then we add that. And you see that has the same effect of, that's the exact same mathematically as say taking the original zero shot and averaging it with the 100% adapted model. So if you average these two models, the result would be the same as taking the just just adding 50 percent of these numbers. So he, he basically introduced this parameter alpha and 50 percent was just an example. And then we were able to explore different alphas. You know, what's the performance if we've just fused 50 percent? What's the performance at 75 percent? So we tried a, a bunch of different numbers and we saw that when we used 70 percent was kind of a sweet spot when we use 70 percent. We had a pretty good boost uh, in all of our models. I mean, the, the kind of boost that actually moves you up multiple ranks in the top five. So that was a good, that was a good secret sauce. And uh, since then, Simon actually suggested the ideas to the maker of the, of the Laura Laura library called Peft, and they've actually uh, they actually implemented it. So in the next release of Peft, it'll be a feature where when you're fusing your adapter, you can actually pick. Uh, you know, wait, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent. You can pick a lower percentage and it'll do this, uh, th th this technique. And now it'll do this for you. That's sick. Wow. That's very cool. Um, in your LoRa adapter. So when you have LoRa adapters, you can apply, right? So a LoRa adapter is just basically an extension of the weights at each of the different layers. And I think there are different ways of doing LoRa adapters. If I do it on the query key and value matrices, am I doing it on the MLP? Layers. Do you have any insight as to which of those types of LoRa's you did, or was it kind of across all of those different layers that you added? You know, this extra trainable unit. It's okay if you didn't. I, I was just curious, actually. Yeah. So we did it to all of them. So it, it's once okay. again goes back to a, a com a common theme. I think a common thing you see in data or with LMs is the more the more the the larger the better, the more the better. So okay. 
when you do the LoRa, yes, you can choose. So essentially, so LoRa only works on linear layers, but linear layers are, um, yeah, it's 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 a, it's the it's the queries, it's it's the keys, it's it's the it's the MLP layers, um, but all all inside the self attention. There's all these layers. Uh, and, uh, you can, you can, yeah, you can selectively choose which ones you want to apply it to. But generally we just, when what we just said, do on every single one you can. So we did all the linear layers, uh, uh, and, and well, yeah, all the different linear modules. And then of course the model itself had, I don't know, 60 or 80 layers. So it does. So we, we pick all the modules and then we also have it do all the modules on every single layer. So we, we, we basically, um, adapt the maximum number of weights that we can mm -hmm. makes sense and i think in phase one of the competition you had this notion of um a logit preprocessor. so you you're really forcing the model to generate very specific outputs um, can you talk about that a bit yeah so this this was a uh, again we're talking about the roles so this was something that, that ahmet uh taught us so it's a i didn't even know about it before ahmet showed it to us uh, but and Ahmet spent all this time working on it, and he perfected it uh, a, a bunch of different ones. But the way it works is this: <clears throat> so all of these models were inferring, we're, we're training them and inferring them in text generation mode. So there's different ways to use language models. So you could put a head. So you could put a head on a language model, and the language model can just say output a number, and it, and it has a regression head, or or a, or a head can output. Um, uh, you know, a, a number between zero and one, and it, it can out, it could have a classification head or this. But anyway, all of these are next token predictions, so they're actually just generating words. That, that that's the models we're training, so it's just generating words. So even though we give it instructions, you don't know what it's going to say. If it was only outputting a number, you know it's outputting a number, right? So this is a number, and we do something with the number. Well, when you just tell the model to output some words, yeah, we're trying to get it to answer certain questions, but we sort of don't know. When we ask it to do it a multiple choice, we want it to say zero, one, two, or three. But who knows? It might say it might spell the word out. It might say T W O, or it might say I was thinking really hard, and this is what I. I mean, you don't know what it's going to say. So the idea with a logic processor is um, when the model. So you, you can use this. So you use this at inference time when the model is about to predict a token. The mod the mod the logic processor. Uh, so what happens is the model essentially will predict a probability. So it's about to predict a token. It'll give a probability to every single possible token, maybe all 100,000 of them. And then it uses the token that has the maximum probability. And that's the first token or, or word that it outputs. Well, what a logic processor does is it, is it, um, it, it um, modifies that procedure. So it gets in there and you could say, hey, I want you to find the problem. So before you pick the final token, I want you to find the uh, the log the probability of each of the number tokens, the, the zero, the one, the two, the three, four. And I want you to increase that probability. I mean, we actually modify the logits, which is um, the untransformed probability. We say, take the logits and just add 100 to it. Hmm. So after doing that, it makes, it makes all the numbers by far more important than any other token. So you see how it forces the model to um to essentially only output numbers and 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 using these techniques you can do other things you can force the model to output tokens that it that it saw inside the question you can force it to um uh yeah so any uh, any creative way that you think there's a benefit to kind of restricting what it outputs and that's what Anamet came up with a, a bunch of different varieties and in, in phase one it it helped boost the score a lot. That's that's a very interesting technique, and I, I guess for those listening, hopefully you you grok that and you're able to um, hopefully Im implement it at some point. So I yes, to... this was, this, well, this I'll say this was this was another this was another um, <coughs> outcome of the competition. So Ahmed already he, Ahmed just released a, a Git uh, <coughs> a Git repository of his logic processor, so it just went public, or I think it's about to go public. And that mm. means so anybody can just uh, add these logic processors to their work. And, and he, he made, uh, I think, about four different kinds. So there's one that, for instance, restricts a model to only outputting numbers. There's one that, that uh, encourages the model to output tokens that it saw inside the question. You know, that, that's important for 
if you're if you want the model to say, say something that it like extract something that was in the original question, well, we can boost that. He has other ones that can affect how long or short the response is. And then I, uh, so yeah, he has a, he has a few varieties and he just published that, uh, that Git. I'm, I'm excited for that because uh, at least in the e-commerce world, I think a lot of the retailers in the world generate money essentially by filtering and to aligning to some product taxonomy. So every large company will have of products has some layout of how all of these products are related and oftentimes when a query comes in they're going to try to match that to say okay what subset of products in my taxonomy should i focus on to find the next best product to rank for you so this seems like a very interesting approach to say okay uh, because a lot of these pipelines well they're multi-model pipelines hey predict the best category predict the product, you know, find the products in the text, et cetera, et cetera, a bunch of NER, name entity recognition. So it'd be interesting to see this technique applied to a fixed number of, let's say, product categories, and I'm only going to boost those at query time. Yeah, yeah, and it works well. And it's, it's an alternative to, you know, the, the alternative way to do it is, is uh, instruction training, where you train a model to follow instructions, but it gives you an alternative. And often, and what we saw in the, in the KDV Cup was, in phase one, we were using smaller models, uh, maybe 7 billion, 20 billion, 34 billion. So a, small, a smaller model uh, doesn't always follow the instructions. You may tell the model only output a number, but it doesn't always listen. So basically, it's an alternative. If, if, if you're not accomplishing what you want with instructions, you can try the logic processor. What we did observe in phase two, when we had stepped up to 70 billion parameter models and 72 billion parameter models, at that point, the models were actually doing a good job of following the instructions without the logic processor because the model gets so big and so smart, you tell it to do something. You say, you know, write a sentence and every word starts with R, it does it. So, but anyway, it's, it, it's, a, uh, it's a nice, uh, yeah, it could work in the, in the case you described. And it's just, and I'll point out that it's just, it's an alternative to uh, other techniques, instruction, uh, using instructions or something else. A funny thought just came in my head. What do you think is the personality of a small model versus a large model? Because you said the larger models, they follow instructions really <laughs> well. So <laughs> what's your gut sense on the personalities of, of a small model versus a large one? That's a good question. So the thing is, I don't know if I can answer that because the models that I interact with are the models I download from the internet. And the personality is, 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 stamped, is actually uh, introduced by whoever trains it. So a lot of these models, you talk with ChatGPT, right? You ask it a question and it says, I can, you might say, I don't know, who's going to win the presidency? And it says, you know, I can't give an opinion. I won't answer that. Or you say this or you say. So all, all of these guardrails and all of these restrictions and you come across saying, OK, uh, ChatGPT is very conservative. It doesn't want to voice an opinion. It doesn't want it, it, it avoids confrontation, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not really the personality of LLMs. That, that was just. That, that personality was created by the training. So that being said, I don't know if I have a sense of what, 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 the, what the pure personalities are because every model that I interact with, the personality was, was sort of created by um, whoever trained it. So, but it would be interesting, you know, if I was in the business of training models from scratch, then I would have more of a sense of, um, you know, if you just trained a model from scratch, I wonder, it'd probably just be, almost like a rebellious kid, right? It probably would just be crazy and do weird <laughs> stuff. But I don't, I never actually did that. I don't have a sense. I don't have a sense of how they behave. And, and then maybe the bigger ones would behave different than the smaller ones. But again, I, things that, the things that I interact with have all been kind of guardrailed, have all been, their personalities are kind of locked down. So I don't really know. Yeah, that would be cool. Like, we should probably ask some folks inside of the video, like, what is, what is the raw, how does the raw <laughs> model behave before you teach it to behave, you know? Uh, yeah. Ooh. So there were four main tasks and the last task was a combination of all four. And the, the reason I'm asking some of these questions, like I work a lot with different retailers and to some degree, I think most people try to do some form of personalization, right? And in the sort of world of e-commerce, what were some of the insights you gained from the competition around, let's say, these models' ability to understand shopping concepts? Yeah. So one thing I walked away with is that uh, you you can you can increase the model's intelligence with fine tuning. So right, you, you download a model that has seventy two billion parameters, 
uh, and you think, can I teach it anything new, right? I mean, let's say you had ChatGPT, which we don't know, maybe it's hundreds of billions of parameters. And you might say, man, it's so smart. Can I teach it anything new? So one of the things I learned in this comp is that fine tuning truly makes a difference. I mean, we truly, we truly uh, improved it. Now it is questionable whether, I guess there's two things we can improve. We were either giving it more domain knowledge or we were actually more um, tuning its behavior, right? Because there's types of questions. It has to learn how I, I can give it uh, 10 products or maybe 10 product reviews. And then I have to, I ask it to sort, you know, which of these product re reviews is most positive to least positive. So it could be that it already knows about products. It might already be able to recognize what's a positive and negative review. So maybe it actually already has the domain knowledge. So maybe all of our fine tuning did was just teach it a new task. The task being, can you rearrange the order? So we either taught it about tasks because the tasks were uh, ranking, which I just described, retrieval, here's 20 things, pick out three for me, a multiple choice, text generation, uh, and name entity recognition. So we may have actually only kind of taught it to be better at tasks or you know, we did pump it full of a lot of more information about products. Like these are popular brands. These are uh, uh, attributes associated with property brands. So, so I guess it's, I'm not exactly sure what we taught it, but I do know that uh, we were able to get the model to do things that pure um, uh, prompt engineering and instruction tuning cannot do. So it definitely shows that, you know, fine tuning has, has, a, uh, has a lot of benefit. That's a strong effect. That's something just occurred to me as well, because you said knowledge, inducing knowledge versus behavior and behavior. And I, I was just thinking, imagine there's a multimodal model that's analyzing, let's say, your style, but it's a, it's a high class fashion uh, LLM or multimodal model. And I'm just imagining one of those shows <clears throat> that's like you're on a runway and it's just it's tearing you down. It'll analyze every little PC of style and be like, this is garbage. No, I want, I want this thing. And I'm just thinking about what it, what it would take to create training data to represent, let's say, uh, a very strict um, high class fashion LLM model. You know what I mean? So I, I just thought I should share that. Um, I got a good laugh internally. All right. So <laughs> tell me your thoughts on, um, on this statement to improve e-commerce personalization. And I was having a discussion with someone about this. So when we try to do personalization, let's say for the online e-commerce realm, we're typically analyzing signal data, signal data meaning all of the customer searches, feedback, purchases, all that stuff. For the online people, and I, I personally have not seen this combination of Store data, this is for folks who have a corresponding store and an e-commerce presence, uh, because my, my gut sense tells me that the purchase of a product in a store has a much higher signal value than a product purchased online to some degree, right? Unless it's like toilet paper or some repeat product, uh, especially for products that have this um, high variability. Well not necessarily high variability, uh, little variability across the product category, like hiking boots. There's so many tiny uh, differences and you have to do a lot of work in order to choose that product. What's your gut sense on including store purchase data into an online e-commerce, both recommendation and search ranking type uh, propensity models, let's say? You bring up an interesting point. There, there probably is a, is a bit of a difference between the two. Um, but in general, when I, what, I've, what I've learned with modeling is, so that being said, uh, maybe, maybe what the model learns with one type of data doesn't necessarily translate to the other type of data. And for instance, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe people buy, one, buy certain things online, but then when they're there in the flesh, they're attracted to that. Like they touch, they touch the, the clothing and they, they see out how it's soft it feels. So, there's definitely different behaviors. So it, it may not be 100% the same patterns, but I do think in general, uh, when things are related enough that, that training on both types of data essentially should make the models smarter in, in both realms. And you could always add a flag, just an additional feature saying uh, online purchase, 
uh, or an in-store purchase. Just have have a Boolean uh, column so the model somewhat knows. But um, yeah, I mean, the more data is always, like we said this earlier, yeah, basically you get that, that data is hard to get because, you know, you'd have to have someone in the store making notes or something or, or following around customers and, and seeing what they're viewing. But if you can get that data, yeah, I think it would help. Well, technically it, it might not, be hard, but I think there's more sort of data privacy concerns inside of stores where uh, I think there's certain rules on how much you can actually track and in, track and identify. I think tracking is is fine, but the moment I identify you as X, uh, I think there's some rules against folks doing that in stores. So maybe that's why it it's always been a kind of a challenge to do that. Because I can imagine I I have a camera. The camera feeds of everybody. If I go into any sort of grocery store and by just looking at a planogram of items, I can know, okay, I turn to look at a shelf. I'm looking at these selection of products if I raise a product. Um, so it'd be interesting to see where that type of information fusion will go into our own sort of shopping algorithms. It, it is very interesting. You're not, get, you're not getting me thinking actually about the future and, and, and how to do this. So I, I think one of the advantages of on, of online is you get, you get more behavioral information. So if you are in the store right now, you know, they, they have you a lot of, a lot of stores have this membership card. So a lot of stores know what people are purchasing, but physical stores, but what physical stores don't have is the viewing history. We don't know that you walked down the dairy aisle first and then the cereal aisle second. We don't know that you looked at these two boxes of cereal and then chose to go with this, or you looked at these two cereal and decided to get neither. But with online shopping, you do. We actually know every single thing they view because you right, you click it to see it. Uh, you click it to see it. You might put something in your cart, take it out of your cart. You might look at uh, shoes before you look at socks, or you might look at socks before you look at shoes. And all these things make a difference. If you look at socks first, you probably buy a different type of shoe than if you look at shoes first. Likewise, the order of aisles you visit in the grocery store, if you go to the, the dairy first, uh, that probably versus you go to the fresh produce first, all this data would say something about a person. you know. And uh, you go to the candy aisle first, that says something about a person. So I really think that if, but what's interesting, the reason you got me thinking is if we ever solve the privacy issues and you could put a whole bunch of cameras in a store. I mean, no one wants people faces tracking, but just hear out this sort of thought experiment. If you had a camera in a store, which was doing facial recognition, and it was actually tracking what you, the, the aisles you walked down, what you touched, what you looked at, if you had all that information, then absolutely models could, could predict the next thing you're going to buy or in five minutes, I know this person is going to be in the pasta section because they just picked out a pasta sauce over here and they just got some sausage over here, right? So if you could collect all that that movement data inside a store, you could um, make real-time suggestions, advertisements in the store, et cetera. But I think people might always resist that because it does seem like a, it, like giving too much information to, to, to AI, right? Yeah, uh, I guess, but you could kind of bound that problem. You know, if I go to the pasta aisle and I pick up, like, okay, I pick up a, a can of vodka sauce for pasta, like, it'll be cool if there's a notification that says, hey, you know, there's this new recipe by this famous Instagram chef. You know, if you go to these two aisles and, you know, you show me that in an app, I think that might be interesting. Uh, I, so I think people are probably a lot closer to that because in some stores you can go, you know, you scan all the product items, especially in the membership stores, instead of going to the cashier, like you just scan in the store. So you kind of know, like in real time, the things that I'm sort of hitting, but you come back to that good problem in terms of viewing. Um, so yeah, it's a, that's a cool problem uh, to solve. Yeah, and you're, and you're right. So some people, you're right. I guess there's there's sort of two perspectives to recommender systems. Either, either but one perspective is that they are very helpful. And the other perspective is that they're too nosy. But in a lot of cases, I agree they're very helpful. For instance, I just finished reading a novel. I want another book. I don't know what book to get. I would love for someone to tell me, Chris, I know you. You're going to love this book. And the funny thing is, all things in life are connected. If 
if a camera knew my shopping behavior at the grocery store, I bet you it could have insight on what book I like. It sounds far-fetched, but as a little experiment, I was showing photos of someone's house to ChatGPT and saying, look at these bookshelves and what book do you think they'll get next? And it was good. It like it guessed the person's occupation from just looking around the house. So if we give it, so it, it's a catch 22. If we give AI more information about ourselves, it will know. It can recommend a new sport for us to play. It can recommend um, foods for us to try. It can rec- recommend new music, books. And, you know, there's definitely moments in our lives where, where, we, where we want suggestions. There's also other moments where maybe we don't want AI to be so nosy. But so it's, uh, yeah, there's pros and cons. It's quite interesting. But now that we have RAG, this because before I, didn't, I don't think we had such strong few shot capabilities. So now, okay, here, take this picture. Okay, just don't retrain on my picture, but take this picture for now of the books you have behind me. Who am I? And, you know, what would I like to be? Or what book should I read next? I think that's, people might be game for that. that so that'll be interesting to see the consumer behavior adoption of that type of uh, machine learning. You did this challenge with the constraints of the competition, right? So you had, a, you had a bomb period of time. You had to deploy on 44 GPUs. So you got to do a bunch of quantization. I'm almost 100% sure you did lose some accuracy to a degree in, in doing that. How would you actually approach this problem if it was fair game? So Amazon put out this competition. But Amazon just said, Chris, we have this problem across these four domains. We want to sell more stuff. We give you any data you want. How would you sort of think through the same problem? It's an interesting question. So the first thing I heard was if you remove a bunch of restrictions, like, yeah, we definitely were restricted with the inference hardware and this, that, and the other. But, and you said we, we lost some accuracy. But I was in a competition after KDD um, on Kaggle, LMSYS, where I had to train some models, but they were smaller. They were just 9 billion parameter. And I kind of was not constrained because it was a smaller model. I could do a, I could do a lot of more things. And, and what I realized was some of these constraints, like the new LoRa technique where you, where you just train uh, you know, a fraction of the parameters, not the full model, and, and all these techniques to make models train faster by, by training a fewer number of parameters and infer faster. Um, there's not necessarily... Uh, I don't think it's a given that there's necessarily an accuracy de- decrease. A lot of the papers on LoRa say people use the LoRa, they use quantization, and they actually maintain the same uh, performance accuracy as if they were to do the full thing. So that being said, I probably would still actually keep all the efficiencies in the pipeline. I would still use LoRa. I would still try to make it infer fast. I wouldn't go crazy there. But if you did give me access to more, I think one thing that I would definitely take advantage of a if you gave me access to tons and tons of more data sets, because it's always the case that more training data is helpful. So if you said, if you gave me access to all of Amazon's products or, or all this user behavior data or, or access to more data, then certainly I think that, was the, that would be the change in my opinion, which we should explore to incorporate that more data. And I think that would boost our models uh, a lot versus, uh, as I just said, I think, you know, if we... Yeah, I don't. I don't think training. Yeah, I don't think removing lore and moving all these uh, efficiencies would give us the gain. But more data would would certainly help. So the other thing, so you did a lot of reformulation of the output of the LLMs to let's say be multiple choice, and I, I've been thinking a lot about this problem. For instance, like if you look at autocomplete inside of a search pipeline, what does autocomplete do? You start giving some strokes, and in real time, this thing is supposed to essentially guide you to whatever other product or, you know, finish the completion. And that's typically done with a lot of engramming of what was done before. And the big challenge there is if I didn't have enough signal from enough people typing out these wrong spellings or typing out the spelling and then clicking a product so I can make that association, my quality of those things are not that good. Um, But coming back to constraining the LLM output, Do you see that as an advantage for using LLMs in very latency constrained pipelines, such as search? Search has a finish in less than 200 milliseconds, typically. Um, Any thoughts there? 
Yeah, that's cer- that would certainly be an advantage. So yes, if you could, uh, that would certainly give you an advantage in inference. So I, I do think that one thing I often see a lot with these with these chat bots, say ChatGPT or whoever, they're very verbose, right? They want to talk and talk and talk and and list all these bullet points and all this kind of stuff. And you're right, every time it puts out a new word, it takes it, it actually takes a lot of compute because each one of those, each word that it comes, it has to, you know, process all of its tens of billions of parameters. Uh, and it, it takes a lot of work. So yes, if you can if you can make the output uh, as concise as possible. Of course, you want it to answer your question. So you don't want it to leave out important information. But oftentimes, I think, I think it gives you more than you need. But yes, if you can somehow uh, make these responses very concise, you know, in the example of multiple choice, the response is literally one number, that's it. So if you can get things very, very concise, that, that would be a huge benefit for inference. Because hey, if you cut the, the tokens in half, you essentially increase the inference time by two. Uh, so um yeah so th- that, that would be a, a very helpful technique what's your prediction for llms being used in search and personalization workflows and let's say in the next two to three years i think i'm definitely seeing a lot of a lot of a lot of use cases of that now i, I feel like that's kind of the direction of lms to turn them into personal assistants because they're all they're so helpful and then the next step is you want them helping you with your work right you want them so as as an employee we're doing work, we're reading emails, we're processing information, but but oftentimes we have a lot of we have we're dealing with a lot of private information. So I think one of the obstacles is how how do you allow these models to kind of talk about private information without uh without uh exposing or releasing the private information. But I think they make uh, rag is a great solution uh because the model never trains on the private information and and an out of the box model can start talking about your private information. Because the private information is just a uh, is just the RAG database, but mm-hmm. I do think that this is uh, I think this is, in my opinion, one of the big areas of growth right now. How we can how we can make the LMs into kind of personal assistants to really help with with specific jobs or tasks and inside companies with private information or inside people's lives with personal information. All right, let's so let's talk about you as a Kaggler and a data scientist. So how does it feel? To be such a great data scientist, like what does that feel like every day you wake up? You're, you're just a badass. You're, you know, Kaga Grandmaster. You could do all these things. Tell me how that feels. So to be honest, I actually don't feel any different, really. You know, okay. I, I, it's easy for me to just forget. In the same, in the same thing, I actually have a PhD, but I never tell anybody, and I forget to even mention it. It's just kind of the same thing. It, it's, I've done it. Yes, uh, I guess, I, I, I do. It does come to my attention, though, at different times. Like when I go to a physical conference, I'll have people run up to me and want to take my photo, or take my picture. I've had people ask for my autograph. And then I'm like, wait a second, who am I? So there are <laughs> moments like that. But when I'm just kind of doing my stuff, hanging out with my friends and family, what have you, you know, I'm just Chris. I, it's not a, I don't, I'm not, I don't feel like this, this big shot guy. Well, that, that's a good Thanks for sharing that. I think where I was going in terms of how does it feel when you've done so much, like you've done so many models across so many different tasks. Oh, I see what you're saying. So like, you know, when you come upon a new problem, how has that level of skill increased your level of confidence and level of excitement when you meet a new challenge? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, no, I absolutely love that. So, right. basically. Participating on Kaggle has given me an opportunity to to um, to do so many, as you said, so many different types of models, and and it's by choice. You know, I, I could just stick with tabular data, or I could just stick with computer vision. But I actually seek out always doing the things that I have not. So, um, so yeah, so and it's great. So yeah, so at this point, I'm I'm experienced in LLMs and natural language processing and computer vision and forecasting and tabular data and signals uh like sound or other waves and uh and uh, and uh and graph neural networks just so much stuff and it is exciting because it's the excitement of of having more tools and you, and anybody who does any kind of work on anything the more tools just give you so much excitement because it, it boosts your creativity you know let's say you're a woodworker and all you had was a saw and a hammer okay you're limited what you can make i could just cut 
But now let's say you have a fancy drill and a miter box and you have of this and a, you just have a, a, a router and all these different things. Suddenly you can put fancy edges on things. And let's say all of a sudden you now add a machine, uh, a machine shop and you can work on metals and you have a foundry. You can now make car parts. So it's, I just feel like I have so many tools that you're right. Basically, I just see a new problem and I could, in my mind, my mind quickly spins and, and I can actually see what would happen if I used a dozen different models. Like what would happen if I use a transformer? What would happen if I used, uh, you know, just boosted trees or this or that? And it's quite exciting because I often, yeah, it's just so exciting and so fun because I, I just love to play and it just gives me, it's like having a kid with more toys, more things to, to do. It's really, uh, all the knowledge and all the experiences is, is a lot of fun. How many years have you been on Kaggle? Five years. So actually, it's funny you mm -hmm. asked this today because just independently, I was kind of reviewing some of my stuff. I'm getting ready for it to make this other talk. So I looked it up. So my first competition was September 20 something like 26 of 2019. So it was exact it's nearly exactly 5 years ago and I've done exactly 75 competitions and I was wow. actually laying them out and looking at the different types and there was, you know, nine different types I mentioned some earlier like computer vision, natural language and just all and I was just reminiscing my the different approaches and the models I use and everything. And that's what's so crazy because now when you show me new data today, my mind can think back to all 75 of those competitions, all five years of that experience. And I just have so many insights, so many things to try. How much did you suck in the beginning when you <laughs> first started? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I struggled like everybody. Um, you know, there was a time I, my status on Kaggle was just novice. I would make a comment and people were, would be like, who is this guy? And they wouldn't, wouldn't respond and stuff. So I think I, I think I always did decent, I, but basically in the beginning, I was just limited by, I just didn't know about a lot of things. So for, for example, there was a day where I didn't know about boosted trees. So I was trying to solve tabular data with just doing a random forest or even trying simple things like logistic regression. They only were performing moderately. So oftentimes some of my, uh, lack of sort of success in the beginning was just a limited a limit a limitation of knowledge which i could say about a lot of caglers you know you just have i didn't i never saw pseudo labeling i didn't know about that trick um i didn't see about proper ways maybe to do a, a proper cross validation so at first you just you're just limited um you just kind of you just just really try to solve a problem with a few things you know and that's that's what limited me at first uh and then each each competition i got better and better because I, I had more more tools i think there are two types of caglers well probably maybe three. One is someone who doesn't necessarily know machine learning. So they come on there and they learn. They're pure, true novice. And then there's someone who has all the fundamentals. They've done their PhD. It's just that they suck at Kaggle competition. So it's really interesting to see, um, would you put yourself in that second category? Because I imagine you had finished your PhD by that time. So you're coming in, you know, you're a professional, you're, you're very well qualified. I mean, now you're coming into this new environment and you're not necessarily proficient, but you still stuck with it. And look, five years later, you're one of the top people. You know, you work at NVIDIA. You basically have the dream job, if I had to say that. Um, what's your thoughts to those two population of people thinking about Kaggling? If that's a move. Um, I don't know if I... Totally understand that too. But what, so I think I think the one type was if you have a strong foundation, maybe in math or computer science, but you're just kind of limiting. You just don't quite know all the techniques yet, so you're limited in that sense. And what was and I what was the what was the other type of category? And the first one is just pure novice. Like I I don't have that background. I don't have a PhD, masters, oh, I maybe see, I see. in my so bachelor's. See, so you, uh, I see. I see. Yeah. I guess it would just make. I guess it just makes learning slower yeah if you didn't have the foundation yeah. okay so the foundation absolutely helped me because my phd is in mathematics so basically what that means is to learn a new model somebody just shows me the equation i remember looking at this book right gradient descent oh here's the formula here's the formula for how you update the weights i look at one one formula and then i know it right who, who could just figure out logistic regression by looking at one formula a lot of people have to kind of do all this work so that's, that, that's helped me a lot, a lot of my life in the sciences. Being a mathematician, a lot of times you can boil things down to uh, a, a simple mathematical formula. So that's been a, that's been a, that's been a huge help. I, 
So I, I learned things, I can learn things with that language very quickly. Uh, but yeah, if you don't have the foundation, you can, you can learn it, but it's going to take longer. You're going to have to really, you know, work through it and, and really, and really work at it. I think so. I think, I think just the learning cur- curve is, is, is a bit slower. How have you seen Gen AI with all these LLM co-pilots um, increase? Has it increased the level of competition in Cargo? Because now everyone can kind of get to a solution faster? Well, see, that's interesting, actually. It's really interesting to know what, what uh, this Gen AI is going to do and how it's going to transform people. I guess I, I, I've seen a small example. And I, so before NVIDIA, I've been a math professor. I, I've taught... Um, college level math. And one of the transitions I saw was I think when I was back in grade school, we didn't have, teachers didn't let us use calculators. So you're doing a lot by hand. You're doing a lot of mental math. We memorized the multiplication tables. We worked out things with pencil and paper. And we did a lot of that. We, we worked out, we converted decimals to fractions and back, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a lot of kids today, uh, they just they have a frac, they just do a lot in their calculator. I think there's like less mental math, more in the calculator. And I actually see at the college level, it's kind of embarrassing. Some college students, uh, you know, I, 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 a simple problem, they struggle with the numbers. They can't actually convert a fraction to a decimal. They can't add two fractions. They don't know about common denominators. So they're kind of lacking some fa- foundation, but it's hard to see how this will affect things because if they always have their calculator next to them, one says, you know, what is the benefit of being able to do it or not do it? And and I have an opinion and other people have opinions, but it's sort of just an opinion. I mean, the bottom line is you have to kind of see what, 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 what they're going to create, what they're going to build. I mean, if, if they're super successful and, and, and create a lot of things, then, then their tools were fine. But it is interesting because it actually is moving a lot of the thinking off of the human onto the tool. Like that was the calculator. And now with, with one of the things I'm seeing with, with, uh, with uh, co-pilots and chat GPTs is it's even helping write code. Right. So people are not going to memorize syntax. I used to and back in school, you have to there'd be exams where I actually had to write out code. There's not even a computer. I had to remember the syntax. So now everybody. So that so sort of all and even basic algorithms, like how do you sort numbers? Eventually, if you need that algorithm written, you just say, hey, chat, write me, uh, you know, write me a number, write me an algorithm to sort numbers quickly. And and maybe maybe there's even so. So, yeah, what's going to happen? Right. But. I think one thing is that humans are still the ones driving the creativity. So one could argue now they're going to spend less time on all, on all this sort of mundane uh, processes, writing this code. And now they can just focus on, on the overall design, being really creative, uh, doing all these pieces. So it, it'll be interesting to kind of see, or it could hurt them. Maybe by not understanding the foundations, maybe that, that limits your knowledge where uh, it'll limit your pro- problem solving skills. So I, I think it's it's somewhat to be seen uh, what, h- how leaning on these tools, if it's truly going to you know, increase human productivity or uh, and then what effect it'll have on sort of intelligence. So these are all these are all things I talk to all my friends that are parents these days. These are all things mm-hmm. they're thinking about. You know, what, what are our children going to be like? I think it's interesting from the perspective of, for instance, you did your PhD. I did my PhD. So up until, let's say, college, we all had more or less the same basic, you know, that same foundational level, right? There might be differences in levels of math that you'd have gone through, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe some folks do chemistry, some didn't do physics, whatever. But we all have to go through this mundane level. Like we all have to go through our own pre-training and it's almost, you know, slight variations across the world. And it, it is interesting to but in that time, those were the most formative years from a, I wouldn't necessarily say a creativity perspective, but from a, a propensity to explore. I do think as we get older, we tend to maybe explore less unless we're, you know, very mentally proficient in that activity. But as a child, like children just naturally go explore. So it would be interesting to just see if you let them, if you don't force them into this track what they end up sort of producing with with tools later on. Because at the end of the day, all of the studying, you had to go get a job to pay for rent, et cetera, et cetera. So there are these, uh, what you call it? There are these foundational constraints that need to survive of quote unquote success, meaning get a job, earn money, survive, and everything else. 
is sort of extra. So that that sort of stuck out to me there. If if I gave a kid the ability to follow a non-traditional track, what would be their end result in quote unquote learning, you know? Well, yeah, that and that's what I wonder about because it, when, when, when I say that kids today are not doing mental math, it's not like they're sitting there and doing nothing. So that just means that they're going to utilize their minds to do something else because, mm-hmm. right, if you're, if you're a school or an institution, you should be having that child work for a number of hours. They should be using their brain on something. So it's not necessarily, so yeah, I, I, so no one's implying that all the tools mean they're just sitting there and doing nothing, right but on. they're actually engaging their brains in different ways. And that's what you're, you're calling this, their pre-training. So you're right. They have very different pre-training that you and I had. And it'll be interesting to see, I mean, where does that lead them? So they, they will have a, some foundation and it'll be different than our foundation. So they'll think differently somehow uh, and what have you. Um, I guess an, an example that comes to mind is certainly kids are such a whiz with tech, right? They're on social media. They're all tech and stuff. So kids will always, they'll grab a new device. Maybe uh, they'll see a new TV and all these buttons and all these things. And they'll just whiz through it and set everything up. And I'll be like, whoa, what's going on? And they'll whiz through something they've never seen before. So already they've got this sort of foundation. And also, so they're developing skills. I guess it'll just be interesting to see, and, but they're still children. They're just still playing, having fun. So it'll kind of be interesting to see when they enter the workforce. When they're project managers, when they're, when they're managers, when they're leading leading stuff, like which it'll be interesting to see what they do. Like which direction do they take things? Uh, how productive are they? It, it's going to be, uh, uh, as you say, a, a very interesting future. So, why did you do your PhD, and what's your advice on whether or not someone should do a PhD to pursue a career? Most, uh, let's say, in data science. Let's just bound it to that for now. I see. I see. Uh, to data science. So I will say, um, so yeah, so the reason, so the reason I pursued the PhD actually at that time, it wasn't a hundred percent data science. So that wasn't the back of my mind a little bit, but actually I think the number one reason I I pursued the PhD was that I wanted to be uh, a a, a, a university level teacher. So I I actually had taught some in high school before my PhD. And, uh, and then I had realized that it I would enjoy more teaching at the university level. And then it's a requirement to have some, um, some graduate degree. So that was probably the reason I went. However, I have always been fascinated with artificial intelligence my entire life. Uh, so my PhD, it, it, it actually is uh, in applied mathematics with a specialization in computational science. So even though the goal was that I could just teach math, that was sort of the goal. I didn't just focus on pure math. I, I added this component of computational science because I have always loved computers. Uh, I've, I've loved um, algorithms. I did research programs and it was sort of the closest you can get to data science. So there was no data science uh, when, I, uh, when I applied school in 2007. But computational science was sort of the closest discipline. So I did sort of leave that option open because I knew it was a passion of mine. But I should say that but my number one motivation was to get the degree so that as, as a means that I would be able to, to teach with it. Why do you think people are afraid of math? So they're either afraid or they love it. I, I, I seldom see people in the, in, 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 the, in the middle. And I think it's just, I think it comes down to if it's how, they're, how their, mind, their brain thinks that way or not. For some, for some people, because the people that sort of do like it and do well at it, it actually comes pretty easy. I will see people that work at it and, 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 and that's great. that. But generally, oftentimes, a lot of people, I think it's just a way of thinking. So I don't know. It's, I think it's maybe how our brains are wired. Some people kind of see the world a little bit. I guess they look out there and, and they, um, yeah, I think, I think they just kind of have a brain that, that it just kind of, it makes sense to them. And, they, uh, and those people end up doing well and they really enjoy it. And then there's people that, because it's a requirement, right? You have to do it in school. So there's those people that are just there because it, it's being forced on them. And they, and they struggle and they don't quite get it. And uh, I think the whole time it's quite a mystery. They don't even see the beauty in it. To me, it's very beautiful. Uh, they, just see, they just see what's the point of this? Like, what is this? So I think it's just uh, either they either it, click it does with take it or time. they don't click with it. It takes time to see the beauty because I asked that question. I think I was fortunate to meet my advisor. So I did chemical engineering and then I switched to, you know, my paper degree systems engineering, but I was you know, my advisor was EE when we were doing machine learning research, you know, from my master's. And 
Like I was absolutely atrocious in math because I, I couldn't care less. Let's just one put that. I don't, I hate school. I don't really like school. I have a PhD, but I don't really care about school. It's something I had to do. So it's interesting that these forcing of constraints, like you're saying, I had to do all the math. I had to do analysis. I had to do, um, but as I really pushed myself into it, I started to see more and I started to appreciate sort of that visualization of how all maybe linear algebra works and um, why sequences converge and all of these things. Uh, but it did take a tremendous amount of work. So what advice do you have for people who want to be at your level, right? So there's always coding skills, but folks that want to be at your level, but they don't, you know, math doesn't come as easy to them. What's your, what's your advice there? Yeah, I guess stick with it. It helps if you find a good teacher. I have heard that often. Um, mm. A lot of times people who didn't, did not like math or struggled with math, then they kind of found that just right teacher who kind of spoke their language and made it fun because math could be not fun, right? Does it, you, it, a teacher could just kind of be quite robotic or kind of, or try to, or try to put a story because it could be devoid of a story, but some teachers will try to put a story to the equations, maybe have props or this or that. So I guess stick with it and they, uh, yeah, as I said, maybe find a good teacher. <laughs> I do think it will help though. I mean, I do think as an encouragement, I, I definitely believe it's the language of data science. Uh, it, it is true that all of deep learning uses linear algebra and calculus. I mean, that's a fact. You know, all of the weights uh, inside of every one of these models is, or certainly these transformers, all the weights are in are matrices. Uh, essentially, when information is traveling through the transformer, it's all, uh, vectors or matrices multiplied by matrices. Uh, and, then, and then the way you train the, this whole idea of gradient descent, uh, uh, um, this, this training method, it's all about using calculus and derivatives to figure out how to update the weight. So it's definitely what makes it all work. And then I would even go a step further to say, just in general, I would say the beauty of math is exactly, I say it all boils down to the beauty that things can simplify to one little equation, right? A whole week of writing on the chalkboard and it's just, it all boils down to this little equation. That's like data science, all these huge data sets, but they boil down to these specific patterns. So there's, there's, a, there's a definitely a, a comparison to the beauty of data science of, of recognizing patterns and the beauty of math that the equation or the concept is this, this little, this pattern. So um, this is all to say that if you struggle, stick with it, and I think it'll help you with data science, and and it'll both will increase the enjoyment of the other. So you have a PhD. You work for the top machine learning company in the world. You're an elite group of people at that company. Um, what advice do you have for people who are currently in their PhD and they let's say want to follow the data science track? What what optimizations do you have for you know um, getting their path? a lot shorter. So back when I entered, so I entered data science, I guess about five, six years ago. At that point, I feel that any background was good because the field was so new that there was people coming from an English background and they jumped right in and helped out with NLP. And there was people coming from a science background and they can't help right with the modeling of, of certain domains and then mathematics helped and computer science. So really it was kind of, and then, you know, companies were just sort of hiring anybody that had a proficiency that could essentially, uh, you know, work with numbers and statistics and do some modeling. So I, I really felt it was the case that there sort of no, was no path. I mean, there was almost just, there was almost sort of no required course that was sort of in the beginning. And I, but I, and that's when I was applying for jobs. And that's why I kind of got the sense of that because data science companies would entertain me or my friends, even though you didn't need experience in data science because the field didn't exist. So you just come in and they ask you some questions. So it's sort of like anybody can get in, but I actually have not applied for jobs recently. So I'm not sure if it's quite like that. So maybe nowadays, maybe data science companies do want a certain background. I'm not, I'm not sure. Like maybe they want a math degree or a computer science degree or, or year or, or, or specific data science classes. So I'm not hundred percent sure, but I guess one would have to research that. And if that's the case, then you have to figure out what they want and take those classes. But from personal experience, I will say that all of knowledge, I feel, ultimately makes one a better data scientist because data science is about patterns and all of knowledge 
has patterns inside of it. So I really think that kind of all of your learning can transfer over to making you a good data scientist. When I met you in person, you told me a, a story about you coding for an incredibly long time. What's the hardest you've worked on a Kaggle competition? So the hardest was my first one, actually. I mm -hmm. never told anybody the true amount I worked on it because it was just too much. I worked so much. So I was actually, I was, <laughs> I, was between, I was between jobs at the time. So I had, you know, all the free time in the world. And I actually took the comp really seriously. I, I, I had these spiral bound notebooks and I filled up maybe 300 page, uh, hundreds of pages but I would take notes on all the features and I'd do all this, I do all this EDA and all these plots. And I had a, I had a schedule I'd adhere to. And every day, you know, I'd, hit, I'd be on my computer for, I'm not going to tell you the number, but just so many hours just every day. And I was just working and working and working. I, just, I put my all into it. Um, and actually I was, uh, um, it's still, it's still a, 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 a happy memory at that time that I worked. I felt I I learned a lot. That's the first time I le I learned about how to train up boosted trees. It's the first time I built a, a deep learning neural network that could take in a whole bunch of features, numerical, categorical. So I learned a lot of things I had never done before. Uh, um, but it's kind of sad. There was a huge shakeup. So I worked all that time. And I didn't get I didn't get any medal. Uh, not a bronze. Not a silver. Or gold. I I almost got like nearly last place in the competition. Uh, whereas on the public leaderboard, I was in the gold. So I was doing, I was sixth or seventh. I was doing great. Um, and I guess I have to say a, a word of my defense. So I actually had the opportunity to talk with the host. I actually got them on the phone and they did confirm that in the second leaderboard, half of the data didn't have a label because they didn't collect it in time. So basically you had to predict labels and half of the data didn't have labels. So it oh. was sort of a true <laughs> shakeup where there was a true unknown component. So it was, it was rougher than most comps is what I'm saying. And, and I just told him my little anecdote about confirming that because every shakeup someone says it was rougher than normal, but, but it, it truly was a really rough comp for a first comp. Hmm. Do you dream about cargo solutions? I do if I'm in the middle of a comp working, um, cause, uh, it'll just, you're just, You'd be thinking a lot all the time. Maybe I, if I even work late in the night before bed, you go to you go to bed, and then I, uh, sometimes uh, if I'm sometimes I'll kind of come in and out of of sleeping at night, and I, uh, and that's when I recognize, wow, I'm still I'm, I'm dreaming and still thinking about the problem. It's not like making sense, but then I'm like, what's? And then you fall back asleep, and then you know you kind of come out of it. That's when you that's when you see your dreams, kind of when you just kind of when you come in and out of sleep, and I and mm -hmm. I I recognize that I'm, I'm thinking about the problem still. So in, in my getting to know you both in person and in this conversation, uh, I think you have a, a very high level of silent grit. What's your advice on increasing your level of grit to do well in competitions and to, you know, you have a very serious competitive drive and I'm very interested as to how you continue to develop that. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I guess that, that is true about myself. Uh, yeah, I didn't give you the number of hours I worked in that first comp, but I did. I did tell you. I um, I, I had told you a few other anecdotes where. Uh, yeah, I mean that thing in college. I was making a website. I got up every morning at four a.m. and I just worked all day. I mean, there was another anecdote where there was a time in college. I actually had to, I had to, I had to hand address envelopes for this uh, little project going on. And uh, it, it, we didn't have a, it, we didn't have the, these addresses digitally. We only had they were in a book, and there was uh, three thousand, and we needed three thousand envelopes, and we didn't have OCR to read it in. I mean, basically, someone had to handwrite them, and then we also had to put in some inserts and fold some paper. I kid you not, for seven, if for one week straight, I would just wake up, I'd sit on the floor on this little table, I'd open this book of addresses. And I would handwrite the envelopes. And I think I worked 15 hours and I went to bed. Woke up the next day, sat on the floor, wrote envelopes. It took me at least five, five six or seven days. That's all I did. That's the only thing I did. I got up. Maybe I had a few snacks, but I didn't even eat many meals. Got up. I just wrote, did all the stuffing. I had to lick a stamp, stick a stamp on. There was all these things you had to like put in the envelope. And, and then I licked the envelope or maybe I had a sponge for that. Or basically, 
just 15 hours straight. So you can see I had this personality trait where I could just do the same thing over and over and over for very long periods of time. Uh, and then even do it over multiple days. And I think that that has that has benefited or that has uh, helped with with my success and that. Um, I don't get that crazy. I maybe in that here or there, but in general, I'm when I'm working on a comp, I'm going out with friends and I'm doing other things. So I'm not like waking up 15 hours. Going to, I'm not like that crazy. But the point is, it does help to have this this sort of single tracked mind where you can just really focus and zero down on one thing. But that didn't answer your question about how you develop it. I'm not quite sure how you develop it. Um, it probably is just a trait of mine because I've I've done that sort of all my life. So I, I don't know how one. Maybe you just develop it by by kind of doing that more often. I what an interesting question. I don't know if Ken Ken G had asked you this question, so I apologize if I'm repeating that question. Uh, are you competitive because? your drive you have a higher drive to win or you don't want to lose that's a good question but i, I would say that my competitiveness is actually i'm always competing against myself okay so okay th and that's an important fact because i know that some people really want to beat someone else but that i actually have no intention of, i don't i have no intention of being better than anybody or beating anybody it's always myself and i think i, I developed it in school and i think that's where i got it because in school um, I was gifted in school and I skipped a bunch of grades and my grades were often, uh, much better than a lot of my classmates. So I wasn't even comparing to them. Basically it was always my goal to get a hundred on every exam. So there was a college class of 300 people and I got, I think a 97 and the rest of the class actually all failed it. They got sixties and seventies. And my professor pulled me aside and said, this was absolutely amazing, blah, blah. But in my mind, I, I, I still failed because I didn't get a hundred. So that's how I am, right? I, I didn't even, it didn't even matter. I mean, that's a crazy story, right? Basically me, 300 people, they all, the whole class failed it. I got a 97. They got in the 60s or 70s. I'm not exaggerating the numbers. But to me, it wasn't a success story because I didn't get the 100. I, I kept focusing on, I looked at those three, the question that I lost points on. And I kept thinking, like, how could I, how could I have learned differently to avoid that? And that's kind of how I've been my whole life. It's always been, I mean, it's not, it's not a good trait. I think as I get older, I'm trying to, trying to work, trying to kind of let that go because life is not about a perfection, but it, it's always been a drive against myself to kind of get all the questions right, to ace the exams. I always loved school and that's kind of, I think, mm -hmm. the heart of my competitiveness. I think, it, but personally, I think it's a beautiful trait and it's interesting that you end up at NVIDIA. So you're a true sort of speed of light person. So speed of light, you know, meaning what is the what is the best that something can be? So it's interesting that you might have that as a core ethos inside of you, uh, which is just you know ex needing external validation or external you know pinpoints to go chase. You you're just internally just chasing and optimizing yourself constantly. So um, you have not found your global or local minimum yet. It seems. Um. What's your career optimization function? So what I mean by that, uh, are you optimizing for free time? Are you optimizing for interesting work, finance? What? I, I know it changes over time, but what's, your, what's been your, sort of your guiding light, you would say? It's a good question. I, I, think, I think what, what, what I, uh, gets me so excited about my work is, is uh, interesting, interesting problems. And, that, and that's a... a, a and that's a benefit of, of my current job in that uh, it's just constantly new stuff we're working on. So every few weeks, there's sort of a new project. It could be something new on Kaggle or it could be something new internally. And I have to learn something new. And it's sort of a new problem. And I think that's what really drives me. Because before NVIDIA, um, I was in academia, but I've, I've, had, I've had some of my own businesses and I've done a lot of different things. And uh, you see my blogs, I was a carpenter and a graphic artist and these things. But I, I think the reason I jumped around so much is because I love learning a new job. I mean, I, I was, a, a, I was a, a pizza maker once and the, the manager, this is after college, and the manager came to me and said, hey, we're opening up a new shop. We need a manager. You want to manage the place? The guy was a mature person. And I said, no, I'm just here. To, I, wanna, I love making the pizzas. I want to learn to make better pizzas. I just love 
making the pizzas. And I didn't, I didn't, I denied the promotion. Right. So I, I love ne- learning new things. I'm just fat. Like, um, whether they be using physical, whether using my, you know, athleticism or whether using my brain or, or some kind of social thing. And, and I love it. And I think NVIDIA offers me this. There's just so many, so much interesting projects going on. And that's, uh, I mean, that's, people wouldn't have thought that Chris would be at a job for five years. But the thing is, every few weeks, it feels like a new job. So it's not like there's nothing I'm getting bored of, right? No, and I, I do give NVIDIA sort of credit for that. They, they have incredible paths for individual contributors. And um, I think something that every data scientist runs into is, do they climb the corporate management ladder or do they pursue the hardcore you know, technical IC path? Not every company has that ability to give folks just pure technical work and not manage um, different people. What's your advice to people when they're at that pivot point? Like, you know, because you're a, you're a rock star I, I see inside of NVIDIA um, and, and you seem very happy. So any thoughts there? Um, I guess my advice would be that my general advice to people in life, which is I think people personally, I, I, I think people should follow their heart. I've done it and it worked out well for me. I know, I know it's, it can't always be done. I know people need to make other decisions. You know, if you're with a fan, if you're, if you're, in a, if you're feeding your family or providing for people, then you might have to choose something that, um, provides more money. But I guess I've always been blessed, uh, that I've been able to follow my heart. As I said, I, I just kind of jump around in jobs. I, you know, I, I, I turned down a promotion. So I've kind of been blessed that I, my life, I've, I've had the, you know, all my needs met. I've been healthy. I've had friends and food and family and all these things. So I've been able to, it's kind of, it's the person who wants to go to school and just be an artist, right? And the, and the, and the parents tell them, no, you should, you should learn a trade or you should do this. And it's, 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 the class, it's, a, it's a classic, uh, I think, decision for everybody in life. You know, do we, do we kind of, yeah, do we, do we just try to do better in our career and kind of, you know, get more money and and that's important because we have bills to pay or do we just kind of do what we enjoy? And personally, my advice is do what you enjoy, but I guess it's important. So yeah, should they take the management role or should they stick in tech? Well, my advice is they should do what they enjoy more. Uh, I would just love tech. I would just, I don't want to. You know, I, I don't want to spend all my time managing per se or telling people what to do. I, I just want to get in there and program. I want to get in there and look at data, right? I want to make the pizzas. I, that's, I, I, I actually would want to stay technical, but you're right. The, but other, there's other opportunities which could pay more. So I don't know. It's, it's a tough one. No, that's great perspective. Um, what are some things you do every day to ensure that you make progress? Hmm. Good question. So I think the, of course, that can be interpreted in many ways because it could be sure. just progress in life, progress in work. And I'm going to interpret it as kind of progress in life. And I would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I would say, uh, yeah, one, one needs to be very, very careful to, to, keep, to, keep, a ba- to keep a balanced life. Um, let me turn the ringer off. Um, to keep a balanced life. And, and, I, and I was much better at it before the pandemic. The pandemic kind of broke my habits because... I don't know, you're working at home, you're kind of not going out a lot. So maybe you could just roll out of bed and go right to your computer and work. But that, but I never used to do that. I, I used to have morning rituals. I do like a lot of stretching, meditation, um, prayer, uh, make sure that you're socializing, make sure you're eating well. I mean, I, I do sports. I love sports. So I would really try to do it, you know, take care of your body, take care of your emotions, take, uh, write in a journal, take, hang out with friends and family, take social, do some work, really try to balance it. But I think I kind of need to get back there because during the pandemic, when I mean, I know we're past the pandemic, but I'm still in the process of getting out of these habits. But during the pandemic, uh, oftentimes, I'm not going out at night, maybe things are closed. So you're sitting around the house, uh, you know, I don't have a roommate. So maybe I'm working in the evenings. So your life gets a little unbalanced. But but back to your question, I think you one should consciously keep their life balanced by making sure they're they're developing themselves in, in all all in all all areas and not just and not just you know pr- improving their career so to speak. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, one of the things I, I learned about you in listening to some of your interviews was that um, you have the expansion mindset, meaning when I say expansion, meaning you, you try to absorb as much information. And, you know, in your own career as a Kagler, you've gone after all these different competitions. So I, I think that's really in line with what you're saying. Have all these different experiences because they can only essentially enhance you you know, let's say as a professional and even as a human um, in the world. Uh, what are three books you recommend folks read? Ha, three books. Do you read? Are you a big reader? I, I'm, I'm a wannabe reader. So you see all those books behind me, like hardcore wannabe reader. I've probably read like three pages out of each book. <laughs> <laughs> so I am a big reader. Um, oh, you lately are. I just... Okay. Yeah, I'm a big reader. So, you know, it wasn't always the case. Actually, in school, I avoided reading. And then it wasn't until I graduated college. Because I was just all math and science in school. I, I, I didn't take the humanities seriously. But then after I graduated college, I, I found a lot of enjoyment. And I, I kept lists. And I would seek out. I read all the classics. And I would get all these popular books, risks, and all, all the tr transformative books and all this and that. And I read hundreds and hundreds. And I was on for years. I was I was actually reading really meaningful, thought provoking, quality books. Now I'm just kind of grabbing. I'm just grabbing every New York Times bestseller. I'm just kind of at this, lately. I've just it's been total total just pleasure reading. I haven't read too many books of quality, I, so I don't really have recommendations. Um, I was just mm. actually at the beach last week. I just read three novels. I won't. I'm not going to quote them, but they, but they were. I mean, I'm not going to. But they were just whatever New York Times bestsellers. So I think that's something I struggle with. I don't make any time for leisurely reading. I'm either reading something technical or I'm reading something on personal development. And I've tried the novel thing and for some reason, maybe it's anxiety in my brain prevents me from doing that. But what has reading non-technical, non-data science stuff done for your thinking and creativity? So it has helped me. It's it's uh my life. It, it, I took an interesting trajectory in regards to this question. So I used to be like that too. So actually, when I was in school, I actually had test. I actually went and had some testing. So when I was in school, I couldn't. I, I was I was oh I I couldn't sit and read a book. I mean, I was always running around. I was doing this, doing that. I could I could not sit down and read. And read a book. I mean, I could I could skim textbook, I could skim math books and absorb it quickly, but I couldn't I couldn't sit and read any kind of uh, humanities kind of stuff. And my mind mm -hmm. would wander. I'd read a few pages. I'd forget what I read. I could, I wasn't patient to read books. So I really didn't. I I really just sort of squeaked by on the whole humanities thing. And it wasn't until after college where it's just the weirdest story. But I was having headaches and. Reading was the only thing I could do. So I, 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 when I would go out and do things, I was having these headaches and I just had to kind of go and sit on the sofa. It happened for like a year. And then I mm. kind of, someone said, well, and I was just sitting there doing nothing. And if I watched TV, it hurt my eyes. Basically, I couldn't do anything. But for some reason, reading books did not, it actually, it worked. It didn't hurt my headache. So for years, that's the only thing I could do. So I actually went from not being able to kind of read a book cover to cover uh, and not even remember the page before till I actually could read a book and I could do it. But it, it wasn't my first book, but I just kept doing that over and over and over to the point now where, you know, I can read and it brings me a lot of great pleasure. And I think what it does for me is it's, it's like a complete vacation. It's, it's sim very similar to meditating. It mm. totally takes my mind to read, to totally engross in a book. You keep nothing in your mind. Like you, my mind's not going back to, oh, I got to remember this. I got to remember this. What about this? I get so in the book that it's, it's like meditating. Every single thing is outside my mind. And, and I'm only, I'm picturing the story. I, I feel the characters. They feel like real people to me. And you're just totally engrossed. So it's, it's, it's an escape, right? And it's, uh, and then when I kind of put it, and then if I put it down for a second and take a break, and I look back around the room, it's like, whoa, this is where I am. So it's this, it's this, it's just this, it's this thing where you totally, it's so refreshing. It just totally takes a break from all your thought process, anything that was in your mind. And then that's why it helps you because then you come back and then um, your brain's fresh. You can dive back into things or what have you. So that, that's, that's what it is for me these days.
So now you've got me excited. My partner's been into like all these fantasy novels. So she went from no reading to an insane amount of reading, like 36 books in some compressed period of time. And it's just interesting to see someone lose themselves in books. And now when I walk around and I, I see different women reading, I'm like, okay, I have a good idea of what it is they're reading because there's a certain uh, track <laughs> of books that's super popular right now. Um, what's your thoughts on, did you ever want to write a book given that you've consumed so many? And have you thought of writing one with an LLM to help you out? <laughs> so I still, I still resist actually having ChatGPT write my stuff. I actually really, I really enjoy writing my own stuff. So I still write my own stuff and I enjoy writing, but um, I guess I've never felt compelled to, to, to tell a story per se. Uh, hmm. What I do cool. love making is I love making teaching materials, right? So I love making slides or I love writing maybe a, a paper to explain how, how something works. Like you, you can see I write tons of Kaggle discussions, like how to, how things work. I absolutely love that stuff. And, um, but yeah, I, I never had just, a, maybe some, yeah, I never had this desire where there's just a story on the tip of my tongue, you know, a hundred page story, just some fantasy story about whatever. I, I never felt compelled in that way, but I do enjoy writing and I, I feel that I, uh, yeah, I mean, some people say they hate writing and writer's block and blah, blah, blah. But whenever I, the things I do write, emails or, or education materials, it just, it writes out quickly. I, I just, I enjoy writing. Are you still tracking your experiments by pencil? I learned that on Sanyam's podcast that you do that. <laughs> is that, is that yeah, still a practice? I, I still am. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. No, I'm okay. very, I'm very, uh, yeah, I'm a very paper and pencil guy. A very, uh, no. Hey, it's clearly working. So maybe we all need to switch to, you know, paper and pencil and, and we become good. Cool. So my last two sort of quick questions. What's one piece of advice that you have for a high schooler, a college student, and a professional? And I, I, I like to make sure that the high schoolers are mentioned because I, I think they're participating in the economy a lot earlier now. So, so what's that one piece of advice? And this could be general life advice. It doesn't have to be data science. I like to just learn. Uh, from people's perspectives. Hmm. So I think regarding a high school student, I guess looking back, and these might just be weird. I mean, because you know, I, if, if the viewers at home know, I, I didn't, I didn't see any of these questions ahead of time. So if I, if I had, I would have prepared. <laughs> so I'm just on the spot. It's a pretty deep question. So I'm just gonna go with it. It might not be the greatest advice, but I guess looking back, I feel that as a high school student, I feel that. You should trust, you should do some things that you don't want. You should do constructive things, uh, like learn things, do sports, do some schooling, socialize. You should do constructive things that you don't necessarily want to do, but that your parents, maybe, and teachers think will benefit you. So I think it's very, very helpful. Looking back, it's very helpful to me that as a kid, like, all the things that I learned, both in education, at the time, I didn't, you never see the point of anything. Also all this socialization, you know, all, hanging out with all these friends and family events and all this stuff and traveling and all this stuff. It, it was more or less, everything was enjoyable for me, but I see how those experiences are, are, are so beneficial when you're older. So if you're a kid and all you wanna do is say, sit at home and play video games and, and, and not do your homework and not hang out with friends and not listen to maybe your parents' suggestions, not pick up a sport, I think you should be doing as many things as you can, like play about, try out a bunch of sports, hang out with a lot of different people, uh, social, you know, definitely engage with your family, learn things in school, even the subjects that you don't particularly like, just, just do them. And I think you should really get outside your comfort zone and do these things because ultimately, uh, yeah, ultimately these are the formative years and th those are skills you'll have. So I think a person should, yeah, and I guess it's a parent's job, and, and my parents really helped me in that regard, to, to really make sure you're showing your kids a huge variety, I think, of activities, right? Social, emotional, athletic, intellectual. You can, yeah, you need to totally, yeah. Th that's my advice, I think, to, to youngsters. Uh, in college, yeah, so now by the time you hit college, I think at this point, you, you're, you'll have already have those foundations. So as a youngster, you, you, be, you did sports, you did, you did social, emotional, you did uh, intellectual. So what's, what's my advice 
in college. I don't know. Maybe maybe now is maybe in college you start following your heart. So maybe when you're younger, you can't 100 mm. percent follow your heart. You got to do a lot of things, things your parents want you to do, teachers. So you want to do a, a variety of activities. Once you have that foundation, maybe when you get in your college years, maybe you don't necessarily always have to make every decision on, oh, what's going to help me with my career? What's going to help me? Maybe, maybe maybe start making some decisions on find yourself. What do you want to do? Right. What, what What brings you pleasure? Is it art? Is it science is it humanities and really take those classes and and start picking activities for yourself so i guess college you should find yourself don't be afraid to be who you are don't be afraid to follow your heart uh maybe that's maybe that's what people should do in college uh decisions shouldn't all be based on future career what your parents want what your friends want like find yourself in college maybe that's the thing and then job wise i guess uh I guess just keep it. So I guess, I guess for job wise, I would say that our paths are not always straight. Um, I'm in my dream job. I never thought I would get here. I was a pizza maker. I was a carpenter. I was all over the place. I didn't know where I'd be, but I got here. So I think, I think one should be, one should trust, right? One should trust in the universe, trust in God, trust in your family, trust, just be optimistic. That as long as you're moving forward, as long as you're doing, doing, learning new things, always giving it all. You always want to give 100% whatever job you do have. Be grateful for your jobs, right? Don't, don't say, oh, I don't want to be here and don't work. Like whatever you're, whatever, you, wherever you are in life, give it your all, work, learn as much as you can and keep your eyes out for opportunities because they're always coming. You hear a word at work. There's this, we're looking for someone to do this or this other company or, or your friend's family starting a business. Like keep your ears out. That's what I did. And don't be afraid to change jobs. Don't be afraid to be unemployed for a few months. That's the number one fear I hear amongst my friends. I can't take a few months off because if I leave this job, I can't get a job. I took years off. I took, I dropped out of school twice and then I got back in school. I left tech and did manual labor. I was all over the place and I'm still successful, right? You got to just trust that. Just keep, just keep doing things and, and keep moving forward. And, and I guess, and then trust that, that things will work out. And I, and I do think as long as you're do as long as you're doing that, that you, you will eventually fall into a job that you love. And that's, I think that's, 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 I think the goal for everybody to, to really be ultimately in a job because you're, it's the majority of your life. So you really want to look forward to waking up every day. And I, uh, and I, and I think that people should be optimistic because I, I really believe that if everybody keeps an open mind, they, they will fall into a, into a job they love. Fantastic. So I have a rapid round of three questions. Um, these are non-data science. So you're stuck on this fictitious island and there's a specialized chef. And that chef can cook anything that you want. Any two meals, they'll fly in any ingredients. Nothing is off the table. Your, your dreams are the limit. Uh, what two meals would you eat? You have to stay on this island for the next 10 years. What two meals would you eat? Wait, so I'm going to repeatedly eat these meals for the 10 years? Or Correct. Are I you just get two food? of them. No, no, you just get those two meals, but that chef will make it whatever it is that you want, you know, for the next 10 years. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, so am I eating local food? food so am I picking the food that I have to eat every day for 10 years? Or am I just picking, or, or I have been eating local food and I get two special dinners and I pick the two special dinners? No, you pick your two favorite foods. That's not has nothing to do with local. Just I'm removing the constraint of oh, I'm on an island, so I can't get buffalo, or I can't get cows. Like uh, whatever exactly. you want, it'll okay. be made. Well, I probably don't need to even. So I actually don't even need you. Do, I don't even need to ask all these clarification questions. I know my favorite is my favorite is macaroni and cheese. I love macaroni and cheese. <laughs> all my friends know it. I eat it almost every other day or every second day. It's so easy to make. I have my own recipe. But I make okay. it with heavy cream. I melt the cheeses in, so it's like very rich. And then, mm. I, uh, and then to that, I'll, I'll add maybe some jalapenos. I'll add some other vegetables. I'll put a meat in there. Often, a spicy sausage or a bacon. My favorite meal for sure. That's my go-to. So I'd have that. And then I guess my other my other favorite is Indian food. So I absolutely love mm. Indian food. I guess it's it's you could sort of almost see the theme. It's also rich, right? It's 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 very creamy. Um, like a vegetable korma or or a, or a 
chicken tikka masala or a, or a chicken makhni and then the, the the naan bread and the rice. But that's those are probably those are my two favorite foods right there. Cool. What's one thing besides data science that brings you joy? Oh, I, I guess that's it's it's gonna be pickleball. So I mean, there's I'm blessed. I have a lot of wonderful things in my life. I got health, I got friends, I got family, I got a lot going on. But, you know, I just love pickleball. I really do. It makes me really happy. Um, it's, That's um, good. Yeah. I'm excited to play you at some point. So, yes, although I, I have not been practicing, but I promise <laughs> to at least uh, try to stress you out with, you know, uh, really hard shots or really sneaky shots just to make you angry and competitive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I am looking forward to that. Yeah, we should uh, maybe maybe next GTC or something. Uh, I'll just every conference, every 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 yes. conference I go to, I'm gonna always pack my pickleball paddle. If you always pack yours, so we might yes, we don't know when I it's will. gonna happen, but uh, there will be a conference. We're both there. We got our paddles, and then and then it's on. I'm game. Maybe, maybe so we my last question. We can, we can, Mark, we, we can get a little footage, and we can put we can we can put on your, we can put on your channel of our match when we play it. Yes, I, I hope I'm I'm a decent. So I used to play a lot of table tennis. So I'm I'm hoping my skills transfer, and I'm pretty athletic. So I hope I can give you a good run for your money. That's my goal. You know, I've been thinking about this a lot. So just so that you know, um, my last question. This is more about uh, life is finite, right? One day Chris will not be here. All of Chris's achievements will be a legend. So I'd like to ask. And it's not about being famous. It's more about what is sort of your guiding principle. What do you want people to remember about you? Interesting. So actually, again, catch me off guard. These aren't things. Oh, that yeah, I have no, this about. is good. Well, my answer is so I think different than other. So I feel that. I don't actually care what people think about. Like that's so mm. like it's not my goal. It, it, if everybody were to forget about me, that, that's fine. So, so my, my goal is not so much that I'm leaving a legacy that I have, I built this thing or I'm well known for something. It's oftentimes I'll, because actually you see this in my nature, I'll do competitions or I'll do things and I won't even take credit for stuff. I'm not, I, my whole life, I told you, I, I, it's a personal fight against myself in, in terms of performance. I don't need the credit. I, I would easily win a comp and give, and then have the team take credit. So I'm not actually mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a credit seeker. Um, so for me, the goal of life is not leaving something behind. I, I'm, 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 I'm very religious. I believe in God. And uh, in that sense, for me, I feel that a successful life is a life that's, that's well lived. Uh, and while, mm. while I'm here, the point is while I'm here, I need to live it well. It doesn't matter me leaving stuff. I'm not here anymore, right? So for me, yep. the, the, the number one goal is, is to, to live my life well. And I think ultimately, in my opinion, I think a life lived well, it really comes down to friends and family and love. And it comes down to your relationships and how much did I pour out my heart to others and how much, you know, did I accept from others? I really think it's it's in relationships. Uh, I think a lot of times career and activities, I think that's just sort of the the stage, so to speak, where these relationships take place, right? I mean, it's, you got you can't you have to do something. We don't just you don't just sit with your friends in a room doing nothing, right? So I feel a lot of the things the things in life that the quote unquote distractions. I think that's just the things, but I think ultimately it's the quality of relationships. And I'm not saying that. I've developed all the best relationships, but to me, I guess that that is my that that would be my goal is is to say that that you know I love my friends and family as much as I can. I, I gave as much as I can. Also, um, I think it's important to you know, give and receive. So you know, I basically I was there for them. I, I received you know I didn't fend off their affection. I, I received there. So I think that's kind of what I strive to. Um, and I, uh, yeah. I think that's. I think it, that that would be a, a life well well lived. If I if I have kind of if if you have, if you feel that you you did kind of all you can in that in that in that in that realm. I appreciate you sharing that because um, you know as I even think about this podcast, uh, I I find a lot of internal resistance in terms of uh, what you call it. 
you shouldn't be doing this. You should maybe focus on. Yeah, for a lot of my life, I've I've been focused on just you know work, work, work. Because I was an international student, so you want to. I didn't want to necessarily stay in my country, so to stay in America, a lot of my, I think up until I was twenty, late twenties, was just school. And you don't know if you're going to, you know, if you don't graduate, you get deported, right? So if you do a PhD, you're not guaranteed to graduate. And so a lot of these things, I think a lot of the passions that I would have had, this is why I, like, I think maybe secretly, secretly, I like to ask these questions. Um, so I like to learn and I like to see people uh, live who they are and not necessarily adapt to like the system that's sort of set up on the ladders that we have to climb. So I thank you for sharing that you know, follow your heart and live a meaningful life. And I, I would definitely second that, you know, being meeting you in person, I, I do feel that warmth. So I, I want you to, to feel that uh, at least through, through some electrons that, you know, you do <laughs> give a warm feeling. And personally, I think you're inspiring a lot of people to, to push themselves, especially, you know, we use Kaggle as a career, but ultimately it's our own self-development to, to push our creativity to solve problems. So I, I, I want to, Make sure that that's recognized that um, your efforts, I think, are inspiring a lot of people. Well, thank you, Mark. I, I appreciate so, yeah, you saying that. that. I mean, well, a this was a... Yeah, and I've enjoyed the episode. So I, I want to always, you know, thank you for your time. And if you do play pickleball, anybody who's listening, you know, challenge Chris at, at the drop of a hat. I'm, I'm sure he'll be ready to take you up on any challenge that comes. <laughs>